Hello everyone and welcome to short review. What we have today is a little different from our normal. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about treatment effect. Um, so what I have in front of me is an invasive ductal carcinoma. Hopefully I'm in focus for you guys. Um, that's uh, had neoadjuvant uh, treatment. So what I'm going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the features that you expect to see with treatment and then why it's important to talk about and think about treatment response. Um, so with treatment response, um, you actually tend to see uh, changes depending on how well the, the tumor responded overall to treatment. And that seems relatively intuitive, um, but what you see on, on the slides uh, will really vary. So in this instance, we have our invasive ductal, which is highlighted by the nice purple marker. And what we can see here is that we have obvious carcinoma. I'll just zoom up a little more to 10x. Okay, so we have our very atypical ductal cells, and uh, this would be consistent with like a, a grade two ductal uh, that's surrounded by you know, there's inflammation, there's some fibrosis, but it doesn't really have the same look that we see with just our invasive cancers. Um, and that's kind of what we see just sprinkled throughout this area. And um, when you're evaluating, just going back to 2x because it's easier to see at lower power, when you're evaluating overall tumor effect, you're going to have one of two things. Minimal effect is going to basically have tumor that looks the same as it did on biopsy with a, a relatively thin rim of fibrosis, like maybe two to three millimeters of fibrosis around. And when you have marked treatment effect, what you'll notice is anything that's maybe normal breast tissue, like here we have more normal benign breast tissue elements, they become atrophic. And you see this dense fibrosis, okay? When you're in areas like this, this very thick fibrotic material, this does not look like normal breast, okay? Um, so that's something that can help you out. And also, your tumor tends to be less cellular, owing in part to the fibrosis. And it also tends to be um, kind of sprinkled throughout what's known as the tumor bed, and that's the area of fibrosis. Um, it's not uncommon to see things like the macrophages. You can see uh, sometimes that they'll be pigment-laden, and the pigment will be hemosiderin. Um, th this case obviously has a lot of lymphocytes, which again are very common, and occasionally you can even see giant cells. Um, you may see changes that are related to biopsy site. Uh, so whether this is the gel, again, the uh, hemosiderin laden macrophages, giant cell reaction, um, but you shouldn't see just normal breast. If all you have is what looks like normal breast and the uh, specimen hasn't been entirely submitted, you need to go back and resample. And same thing with if all you see is tumor bed and it hasn't been entirely submitted, you want to go back and revisit that tumor bed area. Okay, so minimal response versus marked response. Um, other things that you can see with marked response that we're not necessarily appreciating here um, is that sometimes the tumor can appear more poorly differentiated than the biopsy. What's extremely rare is for the tumor to appear more well differentiated. This case is a bit of a, a misnomer or an aside to that because the biopsy was actually a grade 3. Um, and here we have grade two, but you have to keep in mind that all we have are very scattered islands of tumor in this instance. So counting those high mitotic figures to get you to that grade three would be very problematic. Okay, so this is what your ductal looks like. Okay, so we'll just go back up on that for a little bit. Um, uh, so patients who have had uh, chemotherapy or, or radiation therapy, these are things that you would expect to see. You can see them if they've had hormonal or uh, endocrine type treatment, um, but often the changes are very minimal. And um, 
for any of these things, hormones especially, they need to have change for a relatively extended period of time. If the patient has a history of they've been taking hormonal therapy for, say, three weeks, and they went and did the excision, you really wouldn't anticipate seeing any significant treatment effects. So I wouldn't even mention that because the patient at three weeks is not status post uh, neoadjuvant therapy, okay? They're, they're in the middle of therapy and they went and did surgery for any number of reasons. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a couple different slides on this case with the ductal, because uh, some of the slides I think really show the tumor bed a little better. Um, but why is this important to think about? And I'm throwing around terms like neoadjuvant and adjuvant. What does that mean? So here you can kind of see more to the right, we have very dense fibrosis, and then you can hopefully appreciate our tumors closer to the left. And we'll just zoom in on this. So again, that dense fibrosis. And here's our cancer. Okay, and they, these can be very subtle, so you do have to spend a little bit of time with them. But, okay, so adjuvant versus neoadjuvant. So adjuvant uh, means that the patient will have primary surgery followed by treatment. So they, they may have a core biopsy, but they go straight to surgery and then have their treatment after. So whether that's chemo, radiation, hormonal, whatever they're going to do. Neoadjuvant means that the patient has their core biopsy, so they have proven malignancy, they know the hormone receptors, they are treated, again, with chemo or radiation or hormones, uh, depending on what fits for the patient. Then they have surgery and they reevaluate from there. Okay, so just a little difference in the timing. Um, is one better than the other? Not necessarily, but we don't have a lot of data that really tells us is adjuvant always better than neoadjuvant. Um, so again, just getting used to the type of fibrosis that you would expect to see and lots of little lymphocytes scattered throughout here, which again is not uncommon. There are some distinct advantages maybe not necessarily uh, uh, like adjuvant versus neoadjuvant, but the use of neoadjuvant does have some uses. Um, for example, so in this case, this is actually probably a really good time to talk about it. So in this case, we see that there's a little bit of, of tumor, but we have a good amount of tumor beds. So this, this fibrosis that doesn't look like breast tissue, right? Uh, so neoadjuvant uh, therapy, especially neoadjuvant chemotherapy, can shrink tumors and maybe take a patient who went from a very large lesion that they wouldn't be able to easily operate on to something that's more manageable. It can take patients from requiring a mastectomy to get around a tumor to maybe having breast conservation uh, surgery. So these things are, are very important. Uh, to think about because they do affect um, the patient's well-being. Um, things you can think about as far as prognosis, as far as like achieving complete or pathologic complete response, because there's pathologic complete response, there's clinical complete response. Um, so for PCR, pathologic complete response, um, we actually have a very uh, low percentage of patients with ER positive hormones, uh, HER2 negative, that achieve um, complete response. And for low grade tumors, it's about 6%. It's about 11% for, for high grade uh, ER HER2 negative um, lesions. And really? better prognosis in your high grade ER positive lesions. In triple positive patients, so they're ER, PR, HER2 positive, what we notice is that those patients have a 17% advantage, okay, so 17% will achieve pathologic complete response by doing neoadjuvant therapy, but there's no change in their overall prognosis, okay? This patient has an ER, PR negative, HER2 positive tumor, so this is a HER2 positive tumor, Giving this patient neoadjuvant therapy uh, gave, 
statistically gives 31% um, of patients will will obtain complete uh, a complete response. In this instance, this patient didn't, but still, almost one in three chance of having a complete response pathologically is really good. Um, and this will actually increase if they're given HER2 targeted therapy. So whether that's the um, trastuzumab, um, and it also, so we keep stacking on to this, it also gives them a better prognosis at eight years out. And it's similar findings with our triple negative cancer. So triple negative, again, 30% will have a pathologic complete response and they have better prognosis. Okay, so it does matter. Um, doing neoadjuvant, so they've been treated and then we do surgery and we'll go to uh, maybe a lymph node now. Um, uh, sorry, treated, they've had surgery, and then when you have the excision, you're going to reevaluate those hormones, okay? Because maybe they've changed. And a change in those, just to kind of show you, so this is a lymph node from the same case. So what we appreciate is uh, nothing, okay? And hopefully that's what you're seeing with me. This is just uh, some fibrous areas. And over here is what I really wanted to show you. So you might be able to appreciate this at low power, um, but this is a biopsy site. So we have a lot of multinucleated giant cells. So I'm going to zoom in so you guys can appreciate those. And so this is really important because this means that they uh, sampled this node before, whether or not it had cancer in it. Um, and when we're evaluating the lymph nodes, like the sentinel lymph nodes, if they do an axillary dissection, you want to, uh, they, well, the surgeons want to obtain, and you want to ensure that uh, if there was a biopsy node, that that node comes out so that you can evaluate it. The problem in this case is that we have a very prominent biopsy site change. So all of this is biopsy site change. And this is just like normal fibrosis that you can see. Um, and uh, this case was also frozen, so if someone's going, hey, there's some fine-looking cells, yeah, there's frozen artifact in this, just to complicate things. Um, but there's no real fibrosis like we saw in the breast in here, and there's no definite carcinoma in here. Um, but this is important as well, um, because you want to let them know about lymph nodes, um, and if you're looking at lymph nodes, we'll go to a different case. And just to show you what response does look like. So here at 2x, this might not seem like much. OK, but it, it's kind of more pink. And it still kind of looks cellular, so it's, it's funny. Um, even when we see fibrosis and, and all these things in the hilum of lymph nodes, this is still uh, looks different. So if we go to 4x, you might be able to start seeing it. I'll go a little higher. And we start having cells like this guy. Put those front and center. And this is, these are kind of cases that can be very tricky, very troublesome. So this is treatment effect, mild treatment effect, um, within a lymph node that is also positive for a macrometastasis of lobular carcinoma. And uh, lymph nodes have to be evaluated, uh, A, for the biopsy site, and B, because lymph node status does have a huge effect on prognosis, okay? And when we're talking about um, status as far as prognosis, we're 
for the most part talking about micrometastasis, macrometastasis. Isolated tumor cells don't really uh, change much, but this also hasn't been extremely well studied. So um, we might find at one point that maybe we do need to go back and, and revisit these things. Um, but what's really important is that uh, you need to know about half of lymph nodes that do have a metastasis after treatment will have scarring. About 10% of them will have a very prominent histiocytic infiltrate, and about a third of them, so a very large portion of them, will have nothing. So that metastasis is just going to disappear, but you're not going to have any fibrosis, you're not going to have, so no treatment effect, and uh, you may never know that that lymph node was positive, okay? Um, but it's important to note um, the size of your largest metastasis, how many lymph nodes were positive for metastasis, whether it's micro or macro, um, at least uh, in, in our institution and, and many institutions around the country, around the world, use the residual cancer burden score or the RCB score. Uh, which is an online calculator from MD Anderson, and I will have that link in the description so that you can go take a look at that. Um, but really what it looks at, and these cases don't really have anything to show you, but they look at uh, the size of your tumor bed, how much tumor is there, and for, let's, let's, uh, let's show you what this lobular looks like. Start off with 2x, get in focus. And at 2x, well, maybe if it stops doing something funny with the lighting. Uh, so what we notice, now that I've hopefully fixed the lighting a little bit, is that you start seeing those single cells just kind of percolating. They're kind of going around some of the glands. And so here you can see there's some stacking. There's single cells. And they just kind of flit throughout the lesion. Which is very scary because these are very subtle. And what I uh, have been told by, by my mentors, um, and I really appreciate now, like here, maybe it's a little more obvious that there's a few of these cells in there, but treated lobulars almost melt away. These, these cells become so small, there's almost nothing left. Um, so that can make a finding the, the lesion extremely difficult. Um, in that instance, it's not a bad idea to use keratins. Um, and uh, lobular, honestly, probably is the most challenging because, because of all that. Um, what else? You can sometimes see these cases didn't have it, but sometimes instead of seeing like really significant stromal invasion like we had with that invasive ductal, you might just see lymphovascular invasion. And sometimes it'll just be lymphovascular invasion everywhere. Um, and that's not uncommon. Uh, but what these cases don't have is an in situ component. There's no DCIS associated with either of these cases, unfortunately, for me to show you. Um, if you have in situ, you are going to estimate the overall percentage of the lesion that is in situ, at least for the RCB score. Um, there are plenty of other scores out there that you have different parameters. Some of them only rely on lymph nodes. Some of them rely uh, simply on uh, like staging status, like the AJCC staging. Um, but if you're just looking at cellularity of the tumor, um, except for the RCB, I don't think any of them include DCIS in the cellularity. If all you have is DCIS, like let's say you don't have anything that's invasive, uh, you've checked with your immunohistochemical markers, right? So uh, your myoaps, and um, 
all you have is, is DCIS, then that is considered a complete pathologic response. So, so that is a, a PCR. Um, your DCIS, if it's present, maybe I'll just go uh, up to 10x. Let's go 20x so you guys can maybe appreciate the cells a little more. Um, but if you do have DCIS, it's, it's very common for it to be either the same or higher grade. So kind of like we were saying with carcinoma, it can be more poorly differentiated. Um, so that's the same thing you would expect to see with DCIS. Um, sometimes what you can see with DCIS is that all the um, DCIS will appear to be clustered towards the center of the duct and then uh, the outside layers will appear more normal, like more, more like uh, UDH, okay? Uh, those are kind of like the, the main things that you need to know about treatment effect. I just want to show you a few more slides. Um, some of the potential pitfalls, especially with lobular. So again, when you're looking at tissue, you want to evaluate, okay, is this just, is this actually carcinoma? is this uh, inflammation and then when you get to your margins so we start seeing those scary single cells again sometimes it's hard to drive and make sure you're in the spot of interest that you're dotting um, So if we kind of just follow these cells, sometimes what you'll notice is, uh, maybe this isn't the best slide for it. It's okay, we have other slides. Uh, sometimes you get like this sort of like crush area. This one, this is the one I wanted to show. I apologize. Um, so again, if we go back to our 2X, this is nice because you can see there's quite a lot of lesion here. And for a lobular, this is a, not an insignificant amount of lesion, right? Um, but here's our inked margin. And if we go higher power and get in focus. So these are our tumor cells, right? We can see that some of them are single, some of them are stacking. And then you get into this crush area. And again, you see some single cells and these are very difficult to evaluate for. Is that truly a positive margin or is this just uh, microns from the margin? We're at 10X here. So we're getting pretty pretty close to that ink. Um, so that that is something where if you were really suspicious about this, this is an excellent slide to turn around and get keratins on. Um, some of the other things, since I have extra slides here, uh, that can be really tricky is when you're evaluating for mats in lymph nodes, so we're back in a lymph node here. This doesn't really look like much, right? Uh, if we... Try to focus. Um, but what you may appreciate, uh, even though it's subtle, is that at this power, the area underneath the cortex is a little more pink than the surrounding histiocytes, because there are histiocytes in here as well. It's a lymph node. Okay, and then we zoom in. And if you aren't sure, you find areas that are a little more normal. So these are macrophages. We're fine with that, right? Um, but if you go over here, these guys look a little different. The cytoplasm maybe is a little more abundant. In some of them it looks a little more blue, sorry. Come on, technical difficulties. Okay, so <laughs> uh, 
Um, so what you notice is that some of the cells have a little more ample cytoplasm. Some of them look like they have maybe some mucin inside, maybe some, some are, look vacuolated. Some of them might even have uh, nucleoli, but they aren't nice and round like histiocytes. Uh, they're not as bland looking. Um, even though we're not seeing like the full out, like this area maybe up here is, is stacking a little more. I'll just zoom in on that. We're about center, so I don't want to move it. <laughs> um, but that area is almost coin stacking, um, not quite. This is lobular carcinoma. Um, and even though most carcinomas like to go underneath the cortex, what lobular likes to do is sometimes it'll go under the cortex, sometimes it'll be uh, more towards the center. So you really have to be careful and evaluate uh, the entire node for these subtle findings. Um, but that is treatment effect. So we will make sure to put uh, links to the RCB calculator below so you guys can check that out if you want. I'm always happy to answer questions. If you like this video, please hit like. Uh, you can share it on social media. Uh, we have our Twitter handles below in the description for you. And uh, if you aren't subscribed to us, please hit subscribe. The video should have popped up already to let you know uh, that you can subscribe to us. And thank you for sticking around for another short review. We'll see you next time.